Going back to the beginning when you first had a twinkle in your eye thinking about filmmaking, what questions would you have wanted to ask a TIFF alum, a Sundance alum, someone who has distribution? Hmm. That's a very good question. I thought you were, can we go? Can we go to the Howard Stern stuff? <laughs> <laughs> I could ask the next question, but I want to see. You just kind of wore it's just an icebreaker. This, yeah. this, one here. <laughs> okay. um, this is going to be. This is going to be very difficult. Yeah. Hold on. What would we have I could asked? Something um, more fluffy. I think just like understanding the entire distribution process, like like to have, just making the film is just step one, and then the distribution of the entire film is like a whole other monster. So the more you, the distributor allows you to be involved is great. Like we're working with the Orchard right now, and they've they're very open about how things are being um, shared and how things are getting out there, and I think that's very cool to know. And I, I would definitely go back and ask some people, like, what's the best way to, to, to get word of mouth out, out there to raise awareness, especially when you're dealing in the indie feature world where there's not a lot of money for P&A and stuff like that. So just knowing how to create a nice grassroots campaign, I think, would be a good question to, to have an answer to and to get the word out for the movie. I don't know if it's a question necessarily, but I think one of the things that we learn every time we make something is just how many steps there are to the process. Mm -hmm. It feels like it feels like it's all about just being on set and making the thing. And what you forget, especially with something small that doesn't have this huge machine built around it to help it actually become a finished product, that there are so many parts of the process. And uh, I think that we're always surprised, just n not even necessarily how long, but just how much how much sustained effort is needed to to finish something. <laughs> and then just like the second you actually think it's done, there's always that extra three percent, and that three percent is where the movie like becomes finished. It's like where you get your sound mix and your color correction. Like you want it, you want it to be you want it to be done so bad, and like you're so ready to have it finished. Yeah. But there's always that like last hurdle. Uh, with everything that we've ever done, there's been that sort of, that sort of like blast stage, and I think that, um, I think that just, get, like having like to get the advice of just stick it out, it's gonna f you're gonna like hate your movie by the end because you're gonna want it to be done so bad. I mean, I, I we still learn that every single time we make something. Pat, <laughs> um, I think that it's a. Uh, I mean, it's interesting because I think in hindsight, there's the. Uh, there's always stuff that, you know, you would be smarter about, you know, going and attacking again. But I think that it's also, it's one of those things, to speak in what Tyler was saying, like if you knew everything that needed to be done going into it from the beginning and knew that you had to, like, do it again, um, it would be, like, prohibitive in a weird way. And there's something about, like, not knowing w what's going to come your way, good or bad, that's kind of, like, an integral part of the process because I feel like it's sort of a necessary question, you know, it's sort of a necessary wild card. Just to like, that's what, like, if you, if you knew, like, how tough some things were going to be, I think going into it, it might be, like, kind of too scary to think, like, I don't know if I can even get through that. Um, but you do, but part of it is because you don't quite know, like, how in over your head you are a lot of the times, yeah. and, like, and then you just, Blinders. and then you, you kind of find yourself being a lot more capable of doing stuff. Uh, you know, then maybe you would even give yourself credit for. I'll never forget I, when we were location scouting. <laughs> Pat, and I were, Pat and I were scouting at the same time for, you know, me for, like, the Radio Silence segment and he for uh, him for his segment. And you were in Palmdale. I think I was in, um, I think I was you in, were up north. like, Rosamond or in, like, Pear, Pear, uh, Pear Blossom. Oh, sure, yeah. Whatever that was. And I had a call with you. We were, like, you were, you were like, days away from shooting. And yeah you needed a location and we were panicking because we had 12 locations and hadn't had hadn't locked in anything and we had this like really honest conversation about like if i just if i drove my car off the road do you think the movie would, have, would, would maybe the movie not have to happen if i just drove my car off the road it was one of those it was one of those kind of moments but uh i'm, I'm glad that we locked our location I'm yeah like, we oh, nailed it so we got like all the locations we got everything that we needed to do to obviously to make it happen it's crazy. It's crazy how stuff comes together when you just keep... But, I mean, like, if you knew going into it, um, it's pretty wild. Going back, same time, any questions you would have asked yourself about where you are now? I know that seems really, like, out there and weird, but... I mean, I think, I think the hardest thing is just being proactive, right? And, I mean, we certainly live in a time now where the only limitation is, is yourself. You know, anyone can grab a camera mm -hmm. now and make something. And I think that... 
for certainly for the Radio Silence guys, and I think definitely for this film in particular, being being accountable creatively to a group of people that we all that felt really cohesive and really like a family, I think was at the heart of how this movie got got finished. I think if you if you aren't if you aren't really like in love with the idea and in love with the people that you're you're making the idea with it's the, it, those two things they have to those things have to be in place for you to feel like you're going to actually finish finish the project and we just like somehow had this magical experience as a group on this movie and i think that that really pushed it pushed it through to the end mm -hmm. how much confidence versus uncertainty do you all have now about your filmmaking career that's <laughs> <laughs> our question, but I mean, it's such a great town because things can happen so fast for people. Sure. Or maybe they do take a few years and you seem like an overnight success, but then at some point, some of the stuff dies down and we all know that there's like ebbs and flows. So how, how confident, how excited or cautious do you all feel? Well, I, I definitely think there's an inherent uncertainty involved in it. I mean, when you're putting yourself out there and, and putting something out there to create for people to critique and to, for people to watch or to be entertained with, I think there's always going to be an uncertainty factor involved. I think the confidence comes in, like, we'll get the next project done. Like, let's just find a way to get something done and keep moving forward, keep making things and learn something every step of the way. Um, I think we're very... Actually, I'm actually... This group especially, all the filmmakers on Southbound, I think very proud of all of them because literally everything was stacked against us to get the movie made and we found a way to get it done and actually get it out there and make it to the festival circuit which I think was a, was an over accomplishment from when we started out just being like a group of friends saying hey let's go make something that will be fun you know and I think we're happy with where the movie came and we're excited for the life that it lives on after this because now that we've done our due diligence we've done the work like every step of the way what Tyler, Tyler was talking about earlier like how you never, and Pat was talking about, you never realize how many steps there are. But now that it's done, Southbound will be out there forever. And we'll get to look back on it in a couple of years and be like, oh, that was cool that we were able to do that, you know, and have it's a good like time that. with it. So there's always a nice mixture of both uncertainty and confidence, I think, in anything, any project moving forward, no matter how big or small yeah. that you yeah. take. But I think ultimately, like, the only real confidence you can control is your, the confidence you have in your ability to tell, to, like, make something, right? That sure. any time you have, you ask, and this, and this exists to varying degrees on, you know, the whole spectrum of, like, working on a low-budget or no-budget indie thing to working on the biggest studio thing. Um, things, can, things can get taken away really, really easily. The thing that feels like a sure bet can, like, disappear overnight. So... At the end of the day, the only thing you really have confidence wise is your conf the confidence in like the idea or what you're capable mm -hmm. of what you're capable of creating and certainly like every process shakes you in, in that way shakes that confidence to a certain extent but I think that that's we kind of know that we're onto something cool when that's shaken a little bit it's like oh we're, we're sort of challenging ourselves either with how little money the story we're trying to tell with the with the small budget or you know the the concept whatever that is I think that it's also important to kind of be to kind of be a little uncomfortable and challenged <laughs> in the process Absolutely, and maybe yeah. cool things happen when, when you feel that way. Absolutely. Do you get nervous when things are too easy? A little bit. Like, I think, like, if something goes super clean, then you start to, I feel like you start to wonder, like, are we not... <laughs> When's the bottom going to Yeah, exactly. You're waiting for the other shoe to drop, and it kind of feels like... I mean, it's, to a certain degree, um, it, you know, stuff should be challenging enough, like Tyler was saying, where you feel like you're, you're on to something that's actually, like, you know, engaging in a good way. Um, but then if you find yourself, you know, like having a lot of adversity, then you sort of have to wonder, you have to take a minute and be like, are we, is this, are we doing this the wrong way? Like, is there, you know, do we just do something kind of stupid and we need to reassess really quick? If it's too hard or if it's like, you're just, you know, sort of trying to move the production in a way that's like against the way a production should move, you know, things like that. But I think that also, um, if you are just having like a real clean, smooth thing, then sometimes I tend to wonder, like, if maybe, like, yeah, when's the other shoe going to drop? Or, yeah. like, what, you know, kind of looking over your shoulder for that. I remember, like, the early stages of just getting this project through pre-production. Mm -hmm. There were multiple conversations had in, like, the weeks, the week leading up to your shoot, which mm -hmm. was the first thing, where we were, like, we were all, I think, secretly wanting it to push. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We felt like we didn't have the time yeah. uh, to really pull it together the way we wanted to. And it, yeah. we were all, like... 
we all wanted wanted the movie to happen, and there was also this fear that if we pushed, that we would just kind of keep keep, keep pushing, pushing yeah. keep pushing it. Yeah. Uh, I'm super glad that we didn't, that we just pulled the trigger on it. Yeah, when we did. But there was there was definitely there was definitely times where it's like, are we really? Is this the smart thing? Like, are, do we have so many things stacked against us that we're actually <laughs> setting ourselves up to fail instead of succeed? And ultimately, I think you know it was just a matter of doing what we could with the resources that we had. Mm -hmm. In a collaboration like this, who gets to pick the camera? I, well, we Tyler. Group yeah, Tyler had uh, brought to the table um, a couple of options, but we ultimately, as a group, sort of decided, like, you know, yeah, the Alexa. Kind of it was. It was one of those. It, it was also a. Uh, it, it was sort of what would be the most practical choice, essentially, for what we wanted to pull off visually. I think it's kind of what it came down to. Yeah, we were we originally were going to shoot on the Amira, which is an Alexa camera that only shoots sixteen by nine. And then the conversation happened that we wanted to shoot with anamorphic lenses, and it didn't make sense to shoot on that camera. So it was sort of, in a weird way, like the style, the style that we all came to collectively as a group really enforced and really dictated the camera, the camera that we chose and. Certainly, like the speed that we had to shoot with, it was all about making it as lean and mm -hmm. lean and quick to you know quick to set up and take down as possible. What was the temperature like? In I know you shot in what Palmdale, Lancaster, and Twenty Nine Palms. Mm -hmm. what, what was the temperature like? And did anybody kind of freak out from the heat? It wasn't. I mean, when we shot, we shot almost primarily nights, and it was like you know beginning of the year. It was well, it was pretty cool. You were like high desert. <laughs> so I had. Uh, I mean, these brave guys. We're um, essentially hanging out completely naked in like high desert in the middle of the night. So it was like 30 <laughs> to 40 degrees. Um, and, uh, and again, like almost all that stuff was, it was like basically in 30s and 40s while we were shooting because mm -hmm. um, we had no daytime stuff. So it was pretty chilly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but so in the beginning though, because I know with the desert, like there's such a temperature change when people were, were setting up, there was no like heat psychosis. It wasn't too bad. No, I mean, it honestly, it wasn't too hot, like, when we were shooting in days, just because it was um, February, so. You guys got some rain, though, right? Oh, we had rain, you like, the it. second day. Right. In, like, historical drought, we were, like, it was, like, <laughs> the only time it rained was during our exterior shooting days. <laughs> it was, like, so it was just kind of, like, of course. Of course it would be raining on that day. Um, we but, dodged uh, every weather bullet for our piece. Yeah, we kept we, it pretty simple. We had, like, what was it, like, 70 upper 70s during the day and then like 50s at night and we couldn't have asked asked for and gotten a better mm -hmm. a better situation gentlemen you had talked about in a prior interview staying true to your content but also working with brands and incorporating that into your content I know you have um, a very successful youtube channel and i'm wondering what your thoughts are and what your advice is to other creators on staying true to your brand, being able to make a lifestyle from doing the videos, but also incorporating paid sponsorship. I, I think brands are actually kind of cool now, a lot cooler than they used to be. I think that they, they're finally getting the uh, um, content creation element to it. So as long as the creators are staying true to their content and incorporating the brand rather than highlighting the brand or making it seem like it was just for the brand, I think is a cool approach to do it where you can get a paycheck for yourself, you can get your production funded, and also you could work in the brand placement in a nice subtle way rather than hitting your viewers over the head with it. Um, but ultimately it just comes down to staying true to your vision, staying true to your followers and being communicative with everybody that out there that to let them know like, you know, we have this coming up from the great people of Coca-Cola or, you know, whoever the brand is. You're not making Matthew McConaughey Lincoln commercials, but you're making, you know, something that your viewers would expect you to make and incorporating the brand that way. Yeah, I mean, I think it's brands are much more like the storytelling of commercials is, is a much bigger thing now than it is. I feel like even, you know, I, and, and part of it, I think, is just the evolution that commercials are sort of disappearing a little bit with the rise of these kind of digital platforms. Advertising is going to have to be more, brands are going to have to be naturally more integrated into things because there are fewer people like watching actual, you know, advertisements on, you know, cable TV or network TV. So I think that's part of it. I also think, this is going to sound kind of brash, but I think the idea of like selling out is kind of bullshit. It's like this weird sort of I don't know this Western idea that like you can love you can love a creator and then the second that they're actually able to support themselves doing what they do you you like that makes their creating less less interesting. I think that that's kind of a weird like fucked up myth that is of, like of I don't know this kind of 
it's just a weird creation. And I, so I think it's I always unnecessary say, angst. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like why why not support the person who I who finally like gets to do the thing, gets paid to do the thing that they love to do. I it's, it's uh, sort of a strange relationship. But if you know any brands, we're looking. So. <laughs> if any brands are watching this, we're happy to say. <laughs> <laughs>